let's go in our Bibles. We're continuing to talk about walking in the Spirit. And thank you for standing in honor of the Word in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29. Picking up where I left off last week. <clears throat> We're looking for a city. And uh, if you are someone who has ever followed directions prior to Google Maps or MapQuest, you know what it means to look for a city. <laughs> if you've ever been on a trip and uh, whether you're willing to admit that you need directions and stop and ask directions or if you are, as all of us have been at different times, unwilling to stop for directions, you were looking for a city. And the Bible tells us that Abraham was looking for a city, but he was looking for a city that was in a different realm, not made with hands. The foundations were of God, and it was the New Jerusalem. We talked last week about how the New Jerusalem is the foundation for the New Testament church, and it is the mother of us all. I'm trying to encourage you, as the Lord will help through me this Sunday and last Sunday, to walk in the Spirit. And the Bible tells us, Brother James, that if we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the desire of the flesh. The Bible tells us that the flesh is jealous of the Spirit taking up room in our hearts. And the Spirit is jealous of the flesh taking up room in our hearts. The one that wins is the one that we're going to feed the most. And we need to crowd out that flesh. Galatians 4, 29 through 31 as a text. But as then he that was born after the flesh, talking about Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, with a reference to Isaac, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Amen. Brother Allen, would you pray over this message? We ask, dear Lord, that we know our hearts with this message. Give us the understanding that we need. And that we can go forward today and use it in our lives. We thank you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. This was an uncomfortable situation, and as we look at it, we can see a host of domino-like falling errors made on the parts of Abraham and Sarah with regards to their uh, young servant, slave girl, Hagar, and mistreating her and then mistreating her son. But it, it was what it was. And God intended that Abraham, who was a righteous man, despite his mistakes, and Sarah, who was a righteous woman, the, the New Testament calls her, despite her mistakes, God intended that they fulfill their promises, even though that they had baggage. And God took care of the baggage, and He took care of Hagar, He took care of Ishmael. And I just, before I get into my message, I want to say that if you're going to live for the Lord, you're going to have to let Him take care of your baggage. Because we come to Jesus Christ with lots of luggage. And I, I, I have been struggling. I've had pack, packing anxiety for two weeks. And I have been struggling. I got a little hard shell Amazon Basics carry-on. And carry-ons just keep getting smaller and smaller. And uh, I'm afraid of flight attendants, so I don't mess around with them. <laughs> so I got the smallest, the mini carry-on, and I'm gonna and a carry-on backpack, and uh, I'm gonna live out of those two for uh, five weeks. And so I, I got all of that together so that I could do the work of the Lord with less baggage. And this is exactly what Abraham had to do. He had to make sure that his mistakes were covered by God. When he sent them away, the Lord took care of them. He made a way for them and made Ishmael a prince. And they ended up burying, uh, Isaac and Ishmael ended up burying their mother together. And so there was a friendship for thousands of years between the Ishmaelites and the children of Israel. The uh, trouble has happened in the last two or three thousand years. But for the first uh, few millennia, there at least for at least one millennia there was friendship between them and God took care of that when the Lord comes into your life it's going to create some uncomfortable situations with the flesh some of your old relationships that you had and some of the things that you used to do are going to the spirit is going to say you've got to back away from some of these things there are some people that your relationship with them is going to change it's inevitable and some people are going to get mad that you don't go do those things anymore some people are going to get upset because of their 
their proximity to you. The problem with Ishmael and Isaac and Hagar and Sarah was the closeness. Once they were far away and God was taking care of it, the relationship was able to breathe a little bit. Uh, and it's the same with you. There are some places that you're not going to go anymore because the Spirit is saying don't do it. And the Word says don't do it. And there are some things that you won't do anymore because the Spirit and the Word will lead you to not do them. And your resistance is what's keeping Ishmael in your household. And your resistance is what's keeping the flesh from leaving. And what that will do is it will draw other darker things. I'm encouraging you to have the uncomfortable conversations with your flesh. Sometimes you need to have a confrontation with the flesh. The only way that police officers are ever able to deal with anything and ever able to do their job is to be confrontational. Can you imagine a timid police officer? There was, the, you know, there, the comedy shows are made up of timid police officers. You have Barney Fife, who liked to brag, but never really was able to accomplish much with that one bullet in his pocket. And then you had Andy, who had the street-level country boy wisdom that was able to confront most of the things. And the whole point of the Andrew Griffith show was that they were the best of friends and Barney never really accomplished anything as a deputy. But Andy was the sheriff because he was able to confront people and talk about that. I'm going to tell you something. A timid police officer, that, how would that go down when he or she pulls you over for speeding? What if they just, first of all, what if the officer just stayed in the car? <laughs> it was too afraid to get out of the car. That would be very uncomfortable. And you would wonder what was going on. Because if you take off, you're leaving the scene. This is a situation. And what if the officer gets out and stands back there, looks at you and doesn't do anything? What if the officer walks up and says, excuse me, I'm so sorry that I'm bothering you today. I was just wondering if you knew how fast you were going. And oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's no problem. I, mean, I just, I just, I'm just concerned that you might be violating the laws and I'm thinking about the safety of the other people. I'm sorry, I know this offends you. I apologize. Would you like a mint? <laughs> Rather than... Would you like one of these? Would you like to admit? Um, would you like to hear about my children? And pulls out the wallet and begins to show you. How about you? Do you have any kids? Oh, see a non-confrontational police officer. Some of you that feel a calling to stand up comedy. I just gave you gold. Take it. Run with it. Work with it. It's really good. You need to learn to have some conversations with yourself. I'm not talking about the crazy kind. Okay, some people think I am because sometimes I have to correct myself, but I need to learn to have some conversations with myself in which I get up all in my own business and say, I want to walk in the spirit. I want Jesus Christ's way. And there's some things that are going to have to go if it gets a little uncomfortable. If the word of God says I need to lay aside every weight and the sin and the Bible tells me what to lay aside, then I need to lay them aside. Praise the Lord. So the scripture tells us that he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. So those who will follow the flesh like to attack those who walk in wisdom and follow the spirit at the same time. I'm, I'm not talking about those who have no idea what walking in the spirit means and they live lives of chaos. I'm talking those those are people in the world. They have no idea what I'm I'm talking about, what it means to walk in the spirit. But there is a distinct jealousy that I have felt in my life. It's a harsh glare that comes from those who see me as trusting in God. I'm living my best life because I trust in God. This is just my own personal experience. And those people that have been trusting in the flesh all of these years, and they look at me and they say, "There's a." they say, I envy what he has. I want you to know the only reason I have anything is because I've been walking in the Spirit. I've been listening to Jesus Christ. And I am just trying to stay saved. Amen. That's my goal is to make it to heaven. I'm trying to stay saved. When you live for Jesus Christ, you're going to get that glare of jealousy from some people that are bothered by that. And sometimes people will walk away from the goodness of God because other people are jealous of them. Sometimes people will give in to that intimidation. I could urge you, I would just urge you today, don't give in. If someone has an envious nature towards you because you have now found mental peace in Jesus Christ.
You have now found mental a place of mental rest and your emotions are more stable. Not that you have a perfect life. Not that you have everything that you ever wanted, but you have what you need and you begin to get blessed by God and the, the people of the flesh, not only your flesh, but other people that are struggling in chaos. They're not walking in the spirit. They don't understand it. They will be jealous of you. And all you're trying to do is just live for God. This is something that you're going to have to learn to live with because living for Jesus is more important. You've got to not let their attitudes and their actions and their thoughts get on your spirit. Stay close to Jesus and the Ishmaels and the Hagars of this world will not bother you. The characteristics of those who trust in Hagar, which the Bible tells us is representative, as we read last week, Hagar is representative of the earthly Jerusalem, which is a city in Israel. So we know that that city in Israel is a human city. That what happened there 2,000 years ago did not mark it as necessarily a holy place. You won't be more saved if you get baptized in the Jordan River. It'll be an emotional thing. But you can be baptized anywhere in any water in Jesus' name if you believe on Jesus and have repented and you will receive the remission of your sins and the application of the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. And you will receive the first part of your resurrection. So we know that earthly Jerusalem can't save anybody. And so those who like to persecute the spiritual, those people that will persecute you, including your own flesh, they will come against that within you and they will find error in you where there is no error. Let me tell you something. The spirit of deception will cause you to feel like you're doing something wrong when you're just living for Jesus Christ. And when you're living for Jesus Christ, you should have joy in the Lord. And the joy in the Lord is because you're close to him. But when the devil comes along, Brother James, and when the flesh comes along... It will try to make you feel bad for doing nothing. And that is a weight. And if you have situations in your life that continually make you feel bad, give it over to Jesus. Sometimes those weights are things and people that you're married to. And you can't get rid of those weights because you're married to that person. And some of you here today know what I'm talking about. You're trying to live for Jesus and you're doing a good job of living for Jesus. And the Bible says to lay aside sins and you've done so. But then it says lay aside weights. There are some things that are in your life that you can't lay aside like your unsaved spouse, your unsaved husband, your unsaved wife, the child that lives with you that is not saved, the situation that you can't change. You got to go to work. You got a job. It weighs you down. You're worried about those things. I want you to know, keep your eyes on the city whose builder and maker is God. God will work your situation out in time. And in the meantime, he will give you a peace that passes understanding. He will help you and he will lift you up above those things. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Excuse me. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to take a few moments and talk to you today from Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start uh, in verses 1 and 2. Now, of course, I'll give you homework. Read Hebrews chapter 11. And many of you have. It is called the Hall of Faith, kind of like the Hall of Fame. But it talks about these people, and then it goes on to say there are so many other people. The author says, probably Paul, says there are so many other people that I haven't written about in this chapter who were persecuted and they never gave up on the Lord. And so if, if you understand the Hall of Faith, you know how Hebrews 12 and 1 starts, which is to say, because of this, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Or because of these successful ones, let us lay aside every weight, which means to search our lives in holiness for areas where we lack wisdom and are slowed down. Okay? Areas where we lack wisdom and are slowed down. Now, um, one of the ways that they build oil derricks or oil rigs, excuse me, in the ocean is by uh, sliding steel walls together in uh, panels and then draining the ocean and then installing those pylons. They can do it underwater as well. But what that does in certain situations, uh, they do that actually in rivers as well. When there is a river salvage operation, they will 
actually put in uh, air, air, giant airbags or steel and they'll drain the river and let the river run around that area and then they'll go down to the riverbed. Uh, I know that there are several salvage operations that are salvaging large things that are on the bottom of a riverbed or on the bottom of the ocean. And one of the things that they frequently bring up is an anchor. And because the anchors are so heavy. And some of them are very old anchors. Now you have a situation there where you know something went wrong with that ship. Something seriously went wrong with that ship when the anchor would absolutely not move. Now there's a difference between being anchored to Jesus and we used to sing an old song, I'm anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll brave. That's a good thing. Then there's a difference in that than having a weight that is keeping you from going in the direction Jesus wants you to go in. And so sometimes it's time to pull up anchor. Searching our lives because we are on our way to a city. And the river, the Bible says, is the Holy Ghost. When the Bible says rivers of living water, it means rivers of running water. This is the translation. And so we're on this flowing pathway and we're on our way to live for Jesus Christ. And there are things that will get us stuck in the riverbed and in the ocean bed that will not allow us to move forward. The Bible says, and the sin that does so easily beset us. And so the Spirit and the Word work together to reveal things to us so that we can pull up anchor and rid ourselves of those things. And anchor can be a very good thing. It can save your life and it can also rip your ship into pieces if you have it in at the wrong time and it is not lifted up out of the water. The Bible says we're in a race paradigm. The Bible says we're supposed to run this race. And so we will be beset, which means to be tripped. What are the things that will trip us up as we're on our way to live for the Lord, as we are looking for that city? We're trying to get to a place. It is the grace of God that keeps us alive and on the right pathway. It is the grace of God that brought us into this pathway whereby we can run, whereby we can sail, whereby we can move forward into His presence. So if we are not constantly working against sin in our lives, then we will not have the knowledge of sin, which means we will not be able to see the devil when he comes. As I said before, and as I've said Wednesday night, the most important thing for us to do when we realize we're in a battle, and we are in a battle, is to identify the enemy. And then we need to identify those people that are on our side so that we can destroy the enemy and not the people that are on our side, which of course includes the spiritual realm and not vice versa. And so we need to make sure that we understand what sin is. And so we have the scripture that tells us these are danger signs. These are warning signs. When I was learning to drive and then again learning to get my bus license, bus driver license, I had to go over again all of the different signs on the vehicles and all the different signs on the road. And they are there for a reason. And most of them don't have English writing on them for a reason. It's so that everybody, regardless of their native language, will be able to read those things. You can see the swirly line and the curve. And uh, when you go to other countries, they have the same kind of warning signs to give you a warning to let you know. I appreciate the fact that they have changed the falling rock sign over the years. Because it used to say falling rock. And now if you notice, it says fallen rock. Because falling rock makes you not even want to drive on the road. <laughs> falling rock has the, the symbolism of meteors and, and uh, aliens attacking and the end of the world and, you know, asteroids and all this stuff. What kind of road am I driving on? <laughs> Seriously. But the danger, of course, in at least in the United States where the roads are engineered so that the rocks don't fall on them, there's a ditch, there's an angle, and it has been engineered with a grade so that as the rocks fall, they land there so that they're 6 to 10 feet away from you. Uh, but they could splinter and cause some problems with the road. So it's fallen rock. To give you a warning. Well, let me tell you something, friends. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And we need to follow directions. And these are the directions. And of course, B-I-B-L-E does not stand for this. But someone has made up something that's really cool, which is... Basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. And so this is the map. And it tells us the way to go. It tells us the turns to make. But it also gives us warnings to help us. We're looking for a city. The things that will slow us down can also destroy us. 
And so the Bible teaches us about people who have successfully run this race and that they made it. And they are in a great cloud, which is a metaphor for the spirit realm. These people have made it. And they don't have to say anything to us to cheer us on. This is not a reference to someone cheering us on, so to speak. It's a reference to the fact that their souls, which have gone to rest in the Lord, each of their souls, the soul of Mary, the soul of Abraham, the soul of Sarah, the soul of David, makes a statement. And that soul is, I made it through my journey of life. I had sins, I had weights, but I set them aside. And my life says you can make it. My life is exhibit A in the courtroom of time and eternity. And if they made it, you can make it. They made it. They have not seen the city. They died without the promise. But Jesus went and preached to them in that place of the grave. And he revealed himself. He ascended, but first he had descended and went to them. To let them know your life was not for nothing. And we are built on the foundation of those people that make it. I've come today you, to tell you, you can make it to that city. I haven't made it. And those people that are my forebears that went on before me, they haven't made it yet either. But they're at rest in Christ. And their fate is sealed in Jesus Christ. Their eternal uh, uh, life is sealed in Jesus Christ. And one day they're going to see that city because they made it. Because they were able to figure out what was a weight and what was a sin and what not to do. And they were able to grapple with the flesh and the voices of others and to say, I can make it. They didn't get their eyes off of that heavenly city. I want you to think about heaven today. It's coming down from heaven. Praise God. Heaven is coming down from heaven. The new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. The city called heaven. Jesus said he was preparing it. The Bible tells us in verse 2, Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we're not running for anything on this earth, but we're running in Jesus' example. This is a hard one to remember. This is very difficult to remember, that our relationship with God has so much less to do with our temporal needs on this earth than it does our spiritual needs. And because we are faced with our temporal needs every single day. Every day. And their needs. And the Bible says God wants to bless us. And the Bible says God wants us to ask Him and bring supplication before Him. And the Bible says we need to do it boldly so we can have grace in the time of need. And there are so many scriptures about how we can receive blessings from God that we could be tempted to miss the other scriptures, which is the majority of the Bible, which have to do with the spiritual nature of our relationship with God. And so we need to constantly correct our course, which is exactly what you do when you're in a ship. And it's exactly what you do when you're running in a marathon. You've got to constantly correct your course. Because if you're in a marathon and you run and everybody takes a wrong turn and you follow the crowd, you're all going to end up not getting to the end of the 26.5 miles. So you need to make sure that you're not just following the crowd. What if the entire church goes wrong because we don't pay attention to the word and you're reading the word, you'll be able to correct yourself. I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be some churches that are going to stand before God and there might be one or two people that have righteousness in them and the rest don't because everybody followed what one person said regardless of what the word of God said. We need to make sure we are constantly correcting our direction. And so we need to be looking at Jesus. We don't need to be looking at our bank account for salvation. It's there. It's necessary. And God wants to bless you. That's why the Bible says, if you will prove me with tithes and offerings, I will pour out a blessing upon you that you cannot contain. But that is not what the scripture is all about as a whole. Mostly it's about being in the presence of God and getting to know him. And so we're supposed to look to our spouse, the author and the finisher of our faith. No, thank God for marriage. It is spiritual. It is beautiful. Look to our children, look to our families, look to our career. No, our possessions. No, we're looking unto Jesus. He's the one that will help us correct our slight veerings, which we all will make because we are human beings. 
So verse 12, Hebrews 12, 12. Wherefore, which means for this reason, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And, it, and I, I listen to people my whole life say this is the scripture which says take care of old people. But that's not even close to what the scripture is talking about. It's saying when you get tired and when you get feeble, which you will straighten up. And you get exhausted in living for the Lord. Make straight paths for your feet. Correct your direction. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Because you're going to trip up along this pathway. You're going to stub your toe. And you're going to get hurt. And things are going to happen. And there are people that have lived for God and didn't know that. And when bad things happen to them and they're doing their best to live for God by and by they are offended Jesus used the term in the parable of the sower when he talked about the heat of the day destroying the young plant one of the four types of seed was destroyed by the heat of the day they were offended by life and let me tell you something the passage here is saying you're going to get you're going to get your hands hanging down you're going to be tired you're going to get feeble knees and you're going to trip and you're going to end up getting lame handicapped by certain situations and you know, you know the primary reason why it's good when you're going hiking to wear hiking boots rather than tennis shoes? You know why? Because of uneven terrain. Roots, razor sharp rocks. And the hiking boots help even that out. The Word of God does that for us. And you're still going to fall, even with the Word of God. There's going to be times when you're going to get offended. But the Bible says, get up and make straight paths for your feet, or else you'll end up on the wrong pathway. Is anybody, am I the only one that's ever been lost in the woods? I have been lost in the woods before. I've been lost on the road, but I've been lost in the woods. And being lost in the woods is a lot scarier because there's no gas stations there. So the Bible says, make straight paths for your feet. Let your, let your direction be healed. Let your, your wounds be healed. Get back on the right pathway. Follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Paul says in holiness, he literally is saying, through holiness you will overcome your weaknesses. Can you see that? That passage put together in context is through holiness. We are called to follow holiness. And holiness comes through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ comes through His Word. You will not find holiness by only listening to the Holy Ghost. You will find holiness by listening to the Holy Ghost and reading His Word. And you will not find holiness by only reading His Word and not listening to the Holy Ghost. You have to read the Word and listen to the Holy Ghost at the same time. And the Word is given to you in various ways. The Lord presents the Word to you. And to me and I have to correct my errors through holiness holiness is done holiness is taught and holiness is also received in the New Testament we are told that holiness is downloaded from God and it is also actions that we do over and over and over again in this passage Paul commands people to do the actions of holiness as they follow in the right pathway and we are not going to see the Lord without it but we can't have holiness without peace. If we don't have peace, and that peace is something we're supposed to pursue, we can pray for peace that passes understanding and then make stupid decisions and then get mad at God. This is what the flesh does. We've got to make right decisions as we pray for peace. So then there are two builders in every household. Unless the Lord build the house, they that build labor in vain. So there's the Lord that's the builder in that scripture. And then there is the builder, which is me. I've got to work together with Jesus to find that city. He's building it. He's given me directions. He's given me basic instructions before leaving earth. But I've got to connect with them and I've got to do the actions of righteousness. Do these actions of righteousness save me? No, because the Bible says it's his grace that has given me the gift of salvation through remission and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But the Bible also tells me that I have the free will to walk away from him. And if I don't stay on this right pathway, then I will end up looking at the wrong city. As the Bible tells us in verse 15, looking diligently, diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, which is what I just said. 
I can walk away from the grace of God if I so desire. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. And, and of course, this is a defiling thing. Like the, the, the trees in your yard that are trash trees. The ones you don't want. You want to plant. A, if you want to plant a bunch of birch trees, but you've always got other scrub trees coming up, you've got to go down and very deep and get the root. I thank God that when we are walking with Him, we can come to a place where we are free from sin. But bitterness is a sin because it's a bad spirit. And Christians can often get tripped up by bitterness because they feel like they've been done wrong and a lot of times they have been done wrong. And bitterness can feel like we have the right to hold on to it because it doesn't involve going to the places of iniquity and carousing and hanging out and robbing the bank and getting drunk and, and committing all kinds of sins and fornications. Bitterness is just something we hold on to. And we might, may not ever involve ourselves in any sins, but the Bible says there are many Christians who are not defiled by their old sins because they got set free from them, but they're defiled by bitterness because difficult situations are going to happen. Like I said, we're going to get tripped up. We're going to cut our feet on those rocks and we're going to end up in a lame situation. But the Bible gives us no excuse. Get up, be healed, lift up those hands, straighten your knees and make straight paths for your feet. We have the ability to put bitterness aside and give it to Jesus Christ or else we will be defiled. We, we, bitterness will keep us from finding that city. I'm closing. Verse 18 Verses 18 through 24, for you're not coming to the mount that might be touched. Hebrews 12, 18. We're getting to the city. We're not, as Christians, we're not trying to find the actual Mount Zion that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which they, heard, they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. So we're not looking for a Mount Zion on this earth in the fleshly realm. But you're come unto Mount Zion, verse 22. But you're come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. We started out this journey. We were looking for a city. We need to keep our minds and focus on that city. We need the help of the Lord to focus on this. And Paul is writing this passage, and he's saying, I want you to focus and pay attention to where you are headed. There are so many distractions. And he was telling the, them, he, he, he called it Hebrews, the author called it Hebrews, meaning he was writing to Jewish people about the history of the Jewish people as it related to leading up to the covenant of Jesus Christ, him being the perfect high priest. And he was telling this audience of Jewish people, I want you to know, you were raised under the belief that Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Horeb et al. were all what you were looking for. But now I want you to know that you need to change your vision and look for something that is invisible. It is the power of God. It is that holy city. We've got to make it. That means it needs to take priority over everything else in my life. Living for Jesus and making it to heaven. The Bible says in Psalm 119, My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. Hebrews 12.25 See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. I'm telling you, we're in an era of deception and an era of great deception. And we will be deceived if we don't listen to the voice of God. And I want you to know if you've never heard the voice of God, the Lord is always talking. You need to know that He is talking. He's always talking. What He is saying is on a loop. A lot of the things He's saying will be unique to you. 
But a lot of the things the Lord is saying are on a loop. They're in the Word of God. They're like a recording that has been sent out into the universe and it's saying the same thing over and over again. Jesus Christ came, died to save us of our sins. We can receive His death, burial, and resurrection. The world is in the realm of the voice of God, but they can't hear Him and they can't see Him because the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Let it not be you that is blinded. Let it not be you that is made deaf. Listen to the voice of Jesus. Don't refuse Him that is speaking. He's still speaking. The reason we don't hear the voice of God is not because He is silent. It's because we are, are distracted by the things of this world and the things of this life. We will not escape lest we ever think for one second, well, look at me. I'm saved. I'm so much better than all of them. And pity them. If you want to pity the people that are not safe, pity them on your knees, falling before God and praying for their souls and loving them with the love of Christ because someone did the same for you and for me. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth, but also heaven, because right now his voice is speaking grace. His voice is speaking forgiveness. His voice is speaking healing. But Dave was here before church and sat with me and prayed, Dave Groover, and uh, prayed with me for the mission's work. And we talked for about half an hour and he said, somebody recently told him uh, that she picked up a hitchhiker somewhere around Chisago City. This may have happened a couple of years ago, but he said he recently heard about it. And it was an old man, and she took him down the road, and he didn't say anything. And he said to her, Gabriel's lips are on the trumpet. And she was really shaken up by it. And then she stopped the car, and he said, I want to get out right here. And it was nowhere. It was the middle of a field. And she said, okay, are you sure? And he said, yeah. And he got out of the car, and she drove off and looked in the rearview mirror. He was gone. You can believe it or you can not believe it. I choose to believe it because I've heard other people talk about angels. And I've seen manifestations of angels, and, and so has my wife, and some of you have. We're so close. We're so close. He's speaking soft things right now. He's speaking love because we're in the era of mercy and grace. But when he speaks again, and he tells Gabriel to blow the trumpet, there's going to be a shrill blast of a musical note in the universe, whether it's in the spiritual realm and the physical realm, I don't know. But after that, he's going to be speaking judgment. He's going to be speaking destruction. I want to listen to what he's saying now. I want to look for that city now. Why wouldn't you want to look for that city? Why wouldn't you want to do everything the Word of God says you should be doing? Because... He has made all of this available to us. And it's the best. He has given us His best. Verse 27, And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. 28, stand with me. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Remember how powerful He is. And as you serve Him, remember it exactly who it is that you're serving. I pray that God would give you a, a, a strong shift in the way that you view Him today. I pray that God would give us a holy fear of Him. I, that's a good thing, okay? The fear of God is a good thing. Not only understanding His love, but also understanding His severity, which is a scriptural term. He is a consuming fire. Let Him consume you today until there is nothing left but your spiritual eyes. Looking unto Jesus and the city that He's building and saying, Oh Lord Jesus, yes, I have these needs and yes, I have these frustrations and I'm giving them to you. But there's something more important. 
And I want to focus on that. I'm calling you today to walk in the Spirit and give the Lord everything that is within you. This altar is open. I urge you, let's have a prayer meeting right now. Let's have a time where we gather and pray around the front of this church. And let's commit ourselves to Him. Let us look for a holy city. Lord.